It's about 40 degrees outside and not much cooler in here with the studio light shining upon me. Half the continent is on fire and we're drastically behind schedule, which must mean it's the Christmas season. And so welcome to a very grim and grim Christmas 2019. Christmas yet where I haven't lamented that it's felt like it's come out of nowhere and we've all of a sudden ran out of time. But that's perhaps more true this year than any year before because on top of our usual busy October, November and December season, what with organizing all the Halloween and Christmas content, we also during this period and the two months prior, we're organizing the launch of my book Screams from the Crypt as heard by Darkwell Bled. Getting the books here on time and organizing the launch party, which went off exceptionally well, really added to the usually already hectic end of year season. I don't know why we've switched to a green screen background for the first time ever while shilling a book with a green cover, but it is what it is. Regardless, because things were so busy, October content ended up getting moved to November, and by the time November was done with October, Christmas was here. And so, while things were getting pushed around, unfortunately some things went missing. Which means this year, to start off a very grim and grim Christmas, we're revisiting something that we unfortunately didn't yet get to do, namely Spookmas. For those of you who don't know, Spookmas is where we look at Halloween Christmas crossovers, so essentially Christmas horror movies. Usually we look at five of these, but we simply don't have time for that here, and it would turn the entire Christmas special into a horror special, so we're sticking with one. It's been a tradition to start this with Silent Night, Deadly Night, so let's get into looking at the fifth one. Which, by the way, is super hard to find. I had no difficulty getting Silent Night, Deadly Night 1 through 4, even if our copy of 4 is on VHS, but when it comes to 5, it's simply not available in our region code. So, uh, I found it on YouTube, but unfortunately the language is... <laughs> foreign? But on the bright side, after watching the third and fourth Silent Night, Deadly Night, I figured it wouldn't make much of a difference if I didn't understand any of the dialogue, because the story was probably going to be ludicrous anyway. And so I persisted. So let's check out Silent Night Deadly Night 5, The Toy Maker. When I reviewed Silent Night Deadly Night 4, I compared it to Halloween 3 in that they both divert from the ongoing slasher franchises to follow completely unrelated standalone stories that may as well be in different universes from their established series. Well, I'm going to do so again in this video in relation to Silent Night Deadly Night 5, but this time with a bit more cynicism, as rather than it feeling as though the filmmakers wanted to simply explore new ideas, it instead feels like someone has simply stuck the name Silent Night Deadly Night onto a random Christmas horror film in order to profit off of whatever meager brand recognition the Silent Night Deadly Night franchise has to it. Silent Night Deadly Night 5 is, as I said, not following the slasher brothers that we were introduced to in the first three films, nor is it following the new character we were introduced in the fourth, but instead some uh, killer toys. Well, I use the term killer pretty loosely, as past the opening scene, there are only a handful of deaths in the film, and most of them are only barely related to the toys. I mean, to begin with, I'm not counting this guy who fell down the stairs with no toys around him, or this guy who crashes his car because he was playing with toys while driving. I mean, it's not because the toy is evil that he decides to play with the toy while driving. Sure, the toy kills him, but being so distracted while behind the wheel is a death sentence anyway. Don't play with toys while driving, it's simply not safe. 
Oh, so a kid is given rocket skates and gets hit by a car. It's not the same car, unfortunately. That would have been too clever. But this kid doesn't even die, which I believe was cowardice on the part of the director. Now, this is all rather unfortunate because the few actual killer toy related deaths we do get are pretty darn good. I guess the filmmakers just didn't have the time and or budget to do more than two of them, which is a real shame. This small kill count might be okay if the movie had a good storyline, but it doesn't. Which is perhaps not surprising, I mean, Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, 3, and 4 also had weak stories, but at least 2 had some good kills and some ridiculously campy lines, and Silent Night, Deadly Night 3 had that weird robot psychic thing going on, and then Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, once again weak story, but it had some pretty good creature effects. This one unfortunately has far too few killer toy scenes, and the deaths we get aren't very good, and coupled with a weak storyline, well, it doesn't really have much going for it at all. Now, I am saying the story is weak, but I do have to reiterate that I can't speak the language that is spoken throughout the movie, so you might conceivably argue that I'm in no position to judge the storyline of the film because perhaps I don't understand what's going on. And granted, you might be right there. I was definitely judging the entire story by what was shown visually, and when I finished watching the film, I was wondering if I had missed something also, but then when I looked up the film on Wikipedia, I saw that the toy maker's name was Joe Petto, as in Geppetto, and his son's name is Pino, as in Pinocchio. And after those genius namesakes, I figured I probably didn't miss any overly important deeper meaning to the whole thing, because it seems pretty straightforward and pretty on the nose. I really don't think language would have made a big difference in this movie, but I guess until it gets a Region 4 power release, I can't really say for certain, so I maintain that's on the distributors there. So, what is the story so far as I understood it? Well, for the most part, the story is a fantastic showcase of wasted potential. You see, the first to die was a guy who opened a package clearly marked Not Till Christmas, and this death was shortly followed by a commercial showing the toy he was killed by on television. This made me think they were actually going for a whole Silver Shamrock Holiday Countdown to Death sort of thing, Halloween 3 style, where the plan was to give all the kids of the world killer toys, which, when opened on Christmas Day, would run amok and kill everyone. And while that would have been derivative, it at least would have been something. Instead, it seems that in this film, only a small handful of people that are directly exposed to the toy maker are given toys, and of those people, only two of them are kids anyway, so the stakes don't exactly feel very high. Not to mention the kids have zero personality, and the main child doesn't even talk. Not that I would have been able to understand him if he did, but still. Plus, most of the toys seem to begin their rampages at whenever they're choosing, regardless of what day it is and if they've been opened or not. So why even bother from a cinematic standpoint to pointedly show a sign reading don't open till Christmas if it makes no difference to the plot at all? And also on the note of the toys, when these two get attacked while making Nookie in the kid's bed, look at the variety of toys that attack. Are we to assume that from his small workshop he's churning out everything from G.I. Joe figures to remote control cars? That's a pretty diverse repertoire for a small mum and pop operation. Also, on that note, how are these toys even doing this? Do they have actual gunpowder and robotic skeletons? And are they being controlled or are they sentient beings? At first I thought maybe it was magic. I mean, the last Silent Night Deadly Night had magic, so it wasn't a far stretch. But then it's revealed that one of the toy maker's pervert sons is a robot and a really obvious one at that. Why was the toy maker unable to make his robotic son more realistic when he so successfully hid the robotics within the smaller toys? And back to the commercial at the start, was that an ad for one of the toy maker's toys, or is he just making copies of existing toy designs? This film really raises a lot of questions, and none of them are really answered. Unfortunately, overall, Silent Night Deadly Night 5 is the worst of the franchise, which is a shame because it had potential, a lot of it really, and could have been a really cool plot if they just took more time on it. It lacks the body count of the first three, and it lacks the horrific imagery of the fourth, and in the end, it lands as flat as Santa Claus falling off a roof. In the end, I think the only true positive thing about this movie is, being that it is a standalone film, you can totally give this one a miss. 
Instead, I suggest checking out the Christmas episode of Batman the Brave and the Bold, which has pretty much the exact same basic premise, except done right, and has Batman and the Red Tornado in it. Batman rides a reindeer, there are robotic killer Santa Clauses, and the true meaning of Christmas. So, really, it's just better in every aspect. From Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 1, which was actually pretty good, to Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 5, it's kind of amazing at how quickly this franchise is deteriorating. And if I'm going to ask for anything this Christmas, it's that there's not a Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 6, because I'm not sure I can do this again next year. But let's move straight along from Christmas horror to Christmas sci-fi. What have you got for us this year, Grim? Hello, Grim. The sci-fi Christmas movie we're looking at today is Christmas on Mars. Christmas on Mars? Now, does that hold any relation to the movie you looked at last year, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians? No, absolutely not. Oh, thank God. Take it away. Very well. We'll do. Clue title card. Christmas on Mars is a sci-fi Christmas movie made by the Flaming Lips, which is about as weird as you might expect a sci-fi Christmas movie made by the Flaming Lips to be. Now, I haven't really listened to the Flaming Lips for a good decade, but Yoshimi was a total banger of an album, so when I went into this film, I expected it to be chocked full of some crazy laid-back indie rock. It wasn't, though. In fact, the soundtrack is extremely minimalistic, with some scenes having absolutely no audio whatsoever, and for the most part, the film chooses to trade in an actual soundtrack for simple sound effects and electrical humming. This movie, Christmas on Mars, was not the cheesy band-made song fest I expected to be, like what the Beatles or the Ramones gave us, but instead a strange melancholy look at humanity's future cut off from any sense of humanity, grasping for meaning in the cold darkness of space, starving for oxygen and purpose. The film is weird, totally weird, it is also exceptionally good. If I was to compare it in tone and style to anything, from its minimalistic soundtrack to its completely bleak view of a future of mankind in which we've seemingly become extremely distant from our roots, and even really to its cinematography and pacing choices, then I would most closely equate it to THX 1138, but much, much weirder, and if you've seen THX, you'd know that's saying something. But Grim, you say, how weird could it possibly be? Well, it's vagina-headed, oxygen, starvation, fueled, hallucinatory, baby-crushing marching bands weird. Yeah. I obviously can't show any of that, but there is a lot of really surreal imagery and symbolism in this film, representing... I don't know, the anxiety of motherhood when approaching a birth or something? A fear of futurism? Maybe? The death of spiritualism at the cold, unfeeling hands of an age of science? Perhaps? I don't know, what am I, Sigmund Freud? Look, I'm not too proud to admit that most of this film went entirely over my head and left me saying ha huh, and asking what, but that in no way diminished my enjoyment of the movie. It felt as I was watching it that I was just a guest in someone else's strange, likely cheese-induced nightmare, a nightmare that I found entirely fascinating. The film is sort of like good poetry, in that you don't necessarily have to fully understand what they were trying to say to know that they said it in a way that was beautiful. But what is the story, you ask? Well, a Martian colony is approaching its first Christmas, as well as the first birth within the colony. That is, by the way, a human Earth colony that is on Mars, not a colony from Mars, but I digress. The colony itself is struggling and they appear to have equated this upcoming birth as somewhat symbolic of humanity's ability to survive, in that, if the baby doesn't, they won't. In a sense, the baby is therefore their saviour, tying in this birth somewhat to the biblical nativity birth, hence why this was probably made into a Christmas film. There is also an alien who is a visitor from space and brings the gift of a working oxygen system, somewhat mirroring the three wise men, but more obviously Santa, who wasn't in the actual nativity story, but I feel would be added if they ever choose to reboot the religion for modern audiences. It's sort of like the Friday the 13th reboot, where Jason Voorhees has the mask in the first movie. Was that too sacrilegious of a statement? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. 
Regardless, overall, Christmas on Mars is a strange holiday film that at times when viewing it, like those within the film, you may feel as if you are being starved of oxygen and slowly dying. But the imagery is great, the story is fascinating, and the payoff is warm and fuzzy. So watch it if you want a Christmas movie that is artistically intriguing and something truly unique, but not if you're just wanting a light-hearted Hallmark Christmas romance. Thanks for that, Grim, and while I've still got you on the air here, I'd like to quickly present to you the gift I got you this Christmas. It's this copy of Screams from the Crypt as heard by Dark World Bled. An excellent gift for Christmas, and for anyone watching that's worried they missed out on the Christmas season, an excellent gift year-round. Wonderful, thank you. I've actually also got your Christmas present here. Let me just grab it. It's a... Uh, a copy of Screams from the Crypt, as heard by Dark World Blend. You... also got me a copy of Screams from the Crypt, but uh, Grim, I wrote this book. Yes, that's right. It's a perfect Christmas gift this season and throughout the new year. Thanks, I love it. You're very welcome. I did also get you another gift. It's in the console waiting for you now. Well, I'm gonna get onto it right now then. Age of Trouble is a rather simple color matching game in which you, a magical Christmas elf, are working on one of the conveyor belts of Santa Claus's slave-like toy production line, painting all of the toys the right color by Christmas time. It seems that in this certain workplace, there is probably no union and you are almost certainly being paid on commission. As, after all, you get points based on how many you do, and if you don't do enough or make too many mistakes within a short arbitrary time span, well, then it doesn't matter that it's less than a month until Christmas, you're going to get the Santa Toy Sack. It seems like the North Pole has a pretty bad working conditions, and it somewhat makes me wonder if this game's not a prequel to one of the games we played in the previous year from the game compilation The Bite Before Christmas, Santa's Scabs, in which the elves are most certainly picketing. I imagine they're doing so in order to establish a union, because, well, they don't seem to be treated too well in this game. And so, speaking of work, what does your job involve? Well, rather simply, using your pleasure stick, you pilot your elf around, picking up the paint color and then running over and painting the toy. If you paint it the right color, and if you paint all of the toys within a certain amount of time, you get your points and it moves on to the next level, in which you're expected straight back at work. And while I did only play the game up to level 10, I couldn't help but notice I got no weekends. It seems that Santa's workshop is in crunch time, which, to begin with, is not good working conditions. And you may be watching this footage thinking, hang on here, what's wrong with these working conditions? Are you just afraid of a hard day's work? Well, firstly, first, yes, I most certainly am afraid of a hard day's work. That sounds terrible. And secondly, I'd argue it's unfair to fire you for painting these things the wrong color when you're expected to paint them under the conditions I'm doing it under. What exactly am I talking about, you ask? Well, uh, this is what the game looks like in the captured footage. But this is what the game looks like on every single TV I played it on. That's right, folks. It's coming out entirely in black and white, which might give it a nice film noir aesthetic. But I remind you, this is a color matching game. And it is awfully difficult to match colors when everything is just a varying shade of gray. I really don't know what was up with this. I'm using the correct PAL version of the game. The captured footage is actually coming out of the TV's output, so it should be capturing what the TV is seeing because the TV is making the video feed that is being imported into the computer. And no, before you ask, the Atari is not set to black and white. In the end, I had to get kind of creative here and basically refer to the manual to see which colors are in order on the screen, or at least should be, and then stuck sticky notes to the actual television so I knew what I was supposed to be looking at, and then essentially through trial and error, just had to learn what the different toys' colors are supposed to be. 
I actually got surprisingly good at this and found my way all the way to December 10th, the levels are measured in days of December, but every single time a new toy was introduced, which was almost every single level, well, then I had to basically relearn the colors added to my toy cheat sheet, which resulted in me, of course, losing the game, and then having to work my way back up to the position I had just gotten to. As each level passes, there are more varieties of toys included in the game, and these toys have more complicated paint jobs with more than one color being involved in how you have to do it. The graphics are pretty cute, and I like the variety of toys showcased here, especially the AT-AT from the Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back video game, which has actually appeared in a Christmas game before, so it's interesting to see just how festive the Empire seems to be. I just wish that at least one of the televisions in the studio was capable of playing the game in its proper colors as it's captured, because in the captured footage it looks really vibrant and lovely, and it's just a shame that when it comes to playing it on the actual television, well, as I said, it's entirely black and white. I really don't know why this would be, and I've not encountered the issue with any Atari 2600 game before, so it's definitely kind of strange. But irregardless, Toy Shop Trouble is a nice, simple, and fairly addictive game in which you will be trying to beat your high score for a good amount of time. And while I definitely don't think it's as good as the previous Christmas games I've played on this channel, I mean, Stay Frosty 2 is just incredible, Reindeer Rescue is good fun, and the Bite Before Christmas' variety is unmatched, well, uh, even so, Toy Shop Trouble does deliver a good amount of festive entertainment. And so if you're looking to manufacture some Christmas joy this holiday season, then I suggest you check out Toy Shop Trouble for the Atari 2600. And if you're looking to ramp up the difficulty, try turning the color saturation on your TV screen down, because I tell you what, that definitely makes it difficult. And so with that, this special comes to an end. And as it does, I would just like to say thank you all for watching. It's been a really good year for Channel Grin and Grim. We passed 2,000 subscribers. Welcome to the 300 of you that's joined us this year, and to the 1,700 of you that haven't left yet. Thanks for sticking around. We've launched a book which has sold over 100 copies in just a few months, and had an extremely successful launch. And we've uploaded more videos than I can count. So. All that coming to a close, have a Merry Christmas, a safe New Year, and I'll see you next year.